I want to begin with some findings about human judges that have led many to, to be lured to or to find alluring uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence as an adjunct or even replacement of human judgment. Then what I want to do is I want to sort of talk about the larger uh, legal tech movement um, that I think is often based on theories of disruptive innovation and automation that I think I want to contest. Um, then what I want to argue, and this is really the core of my remarks today, is that there is a great deal of excitement uh, and marketing now for legal technology and disruptive innovation in the legal academy in other spaces. Almost simultaneously as that movement has been gaining strength, there is another parallel movement called algorithmic accountability. And this algorithmic accountability movement for about 10 years has been critiquing the automated systems that the legal tech movement is really highly valuing now. And I think one of the next step in a lot of legal scholarship here and critical commentary will be, how do we bring these two communities of inquiry together? Right? How do we bring some of the canon of findings from the algorithmic accountability group to the hashtag legal tech group? Um, <laughs> to give a, an easy to follow hashtag on Twitter where you can constantly see you know, new conferences, new marketing, et cetera. Okay, so to begin, um, I'm gonna start with number one, which is the reasons, some reasons why uh, automation seems comparatively worthwhile. Recently, there were some studies that showed that uh, judges would give harsher sentences right before lunch rather than after lunch, okay? <laughs> and uh, this was reported in Dan Ariely's book, uh, Predictably Irrational. I forget the, I'm, I apologize, I forget the name of the researchers who came up with the finding. But this was seized upon by many folks that really believe in uh, advancing legal technology to say, look at what very important decisions made about how long someone spends in prison affected by these ephemeral and uh, really troubling aspects of the judgment. There was an even more damning uh, study more recently about what I would call the sad football fan judges, which is uh, American football. But they, there are judges, I think, in Louisiana who, after LSU lost a football game, would give harsher sentences, particularly to minority defendants. You know, just a terrible finding, right? Very troubling finding. Now, in, in the rule of persons not machine paper, what I say is that we need to be open as attorneys in the legal profession to this type of data about judgments and the potentially extraneous influences on, ju on judgments, right? Because we should be getting constant feedback, just as Maria was talking about, about the performance of the legal system. But unfortunately, I think a lot of folks in the disruptive innovation community sort of seized on this. There's a podcast called The Weeds in America, sort of this very, uh, I think, insightful, often in-depth podcast, which seized on this and said, you know, maybe we just need automatic sentencing, you know, or just we need to process the facts into a computer. Um, which, by the way, if we think about the sentencing guidelines in the US context and all the controversy over judges' discretion in those, and the uh, grid in the context of social security disability determinations, there are sort of little steps toward like rulifying versus standard <laughs> standards in law, right? That could lead us toward really finding this alluring. And that leads to a whole literature of people inspired by Clayton Christensen's theory of disruptive innovation to say, okay, sure, at the beginning, machines, if we say sentenced people by machine, they're not gonna be as context aware or as sensitive as people. But eventually, if we commit to this project, then they're going to meet human acuity and then exceed it, right? And by the way, just recently, an algorithm that uh, sets bail, there's an algorithm that was looking at bail determinations sponsored by, uh, I think, a foundation that wants to apply more algorithmic approaches in law. And it turned out that this algorithm was more, was better than judges at predicting from a certain corpus of data whether the person who was getting uh, up for bail was a flight risk or not, okay? So, and, and also the algorithm tended to be uh, softer on minority uh, defendants rather than harsher on them. Uh, so that led to a lot of enthusiasm for this sort of algorithm to replace human judgment, et cetera. But I think we have to step back from that a little bit. And before we sort of jump on the disruptive innovation bandwagon of folks like Christensen, I think Brynjolfsson and McAfee's book, The Second Machine Age, goes in the same way, direction, the same with Jerry Kaplan's Humans Need Not Apply. Before we go in the direction of those thinkers, I think we have to consult, and this is the third part of my remarks today, 
the canon of algorithmic accountability. So what is this canon? Well, if you want to find, uh, there, there are, if you Google online, uh, sort of the, um, uh, the social media collective by Tarleton Gillespie, he has a work of like 100 works in algorithmic accountability that are really important to know. But I'm just going to focus on four today, or just mention four uh, authors who I think are really important here. The first being Helen Nissenbaum and Lucas Entrona, who in their 1999 piece on the politics of search engines, were very far ahead of the curve about the ethical implications of, say, outsourcing human judgment to a mechanized system or an automatic system for, say, determining the relevance of given facts or the importance of different sources of information, right, in their critique of search engines. I think that was a very important contribution. And Trona, by the way, in more recent work, has looked at the ethics of plagiarism detection software. So exactly the questions that Lorraine was bringing up earlier, you know, in terms of eventually having this machine learning system in the view of someone like Pedro Domingos's uh, The Master Algorithm, unmoored from human, human judgment and just making its own decisions, you know, I think Introna really helps us to articulate philosophically the discomfort we may feel at that, right? Because a lot of times there's this problem of like people objecting to data collection as creepy, but as Omar Tani and Jules Polonetsky show, people don't often really philosophically articulate it, but, but Introna does, and we can get into that more in the questions and answers if we'd like. The second work in the canon of algorithmic accountability that I think is critical is a 2008 article by Danielle Citron called Technological Due Process. And what she looks at is, and she's my colleague at the University of Maryland, really a, a wonderful scholar, um, has pioneered a, a movement called Cyber Civil Rights to fight for the rights of women and minorities online uh, against uh, harassment, a work that was incredibly prescient uh, and, and only becomes more relevant. And in her work, Technological Due Process, what she argues is she looks at some case studies of, for example, the Colorado Benefits Management System. And this Benefits Management System, it would be programmed to sort of automatically make determinations as to whether someone qualified for Medicaid or not. And from the outside, one may look at this as, say, a prototype for algorithmic approaches to uh, de de decision making in the administrative context. And I'd love for us to get into this contrast between public administration and law, because that's a really, really interesting jurisprudential, jurisprudential question. Um, but it turned out that many times the programmers didn't really understand the full implications of admittedly complex interactions between state and federal health law in the US, right? So for example, women who were due coverage for their breast cancer under a federal law that superseded Colorado's statutes on eligibility were nevertheless denied the eligibility because the programmers did not understand the concept of preemption in that context, right? So this is a very deep problem for law, I think. And, and I often hear from folks who are more partial to algorithmic approaches who say, you know, with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. Thanks for telling us about this. We'll correct that error all in the future. You know, it's a very, and, and it's a very complacent attitude I hear often. And, but the sad thing is that if you look at the Centrelink scandal that is rocking the lives of many claimants in Australia right now, exactly the same type of problem. Nobody learned. Okay? And we see this over and over again that you have a number of very visionary or insightful scholars in the algorithmic accountability movement who are either ignored or discounted by so many of the authorities who are now implementing these systems. The third example in the canon that I would give is a paper by Boyd and Crawford um, about problems of big data, six questions about big data. And it really, I think, crisply summarizes uh, some of the concerns that were raised, you know, also very crisply and insightfully in Murray's talk about, you know, where did we get the data? How did we decide what data to use? What was our goal? Who set the goals for the program? Is it contestable? Is it revisable? And in a piece by Citron and I called Promoting Innovation and Preventing Discrimination in the Scored Society, we try to actually uh, reduce into a chart the degree of revisability, transparency, and accountability that are in various algorithmic systems, right? And I think that's got to be critical, a foundational step before we see much more application of algorithmic approaches in law. So my fourth and final part of my remarks today is going to look at a couple of things, you know, and I'm going to return to the hungry judges and the sad football loser judges for a second, which is to say, yes, Let's get feedback on how human judges are doing, but let's use that, let's frame that as a way of improving human judgment rather than replacing them. And there's a whole book by John Markoff uh, called Machines of Love and Grace, which draws the distinction between artificial intelligence and intelligence augmentation, and talks about how some of the most important technological pioneers, they weren't committed to a vision of artificial intelligence replacing people. They were committed to a vision of technology augmenting, enriching, improving the practice of human uh, workers. 
The second uh, thing that I want to just discuss and be sure that's on, on everyone's mind today is that there was a group in China at Shanghai Zhao Tong University, which recently released a study where they uh, tried to have automated inferences of criminality based on facial features. Okay? They had a, a group of about 2,000 faces of criminals, 2,000 faces of non-criminals, and they released a paper, uh, it's put up on our uh, AR archive, ARXIV, um, where they said, you know, we, it turns out that the criminal folks are really uh, similar in many ways. And we've got four archetypal examples of criminal faces and three archetypal examples of the non-criminal faces, okay? And what I thought was really amazing about this is they said, and because it's a machine doing the classification, there's no human bias to this. So, so you know, and I, I forget, who was the criminal phrenologist, Sambrosa? Well, who was that? Sambro uh, Cesar Lombrosa. Lombrosa, that's it, yes. So, I mean, I thought, you know, this a lot of people said, this is just a revival of phrenology, right? But that is the danger when you have algorithmic systems that are disconnected from awareness of social science, history, other important factors, right? Because I think anyone that had even an elementary exposure to the history of criminology and phrenology would know the dangers of such a process, right? Also, by the way, anyone with sort of a nodding acquaintance with common sense might guess that some time in prison might change how your face looks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think these sorts of, of, of issues, and, by the, and I'll end with the European Court of Human Rights Judgment, which I think you know, Lorraine just really expertly dissected. I was listening to a podcast called Future Tense last week where they interviewed the lead author of the study. And what was astonishing to me was all of the journalists who got the study seized on it as Ha ha, we, you know, almost taking a, ripping the page out of Andrew Abbott's book on the professions, saying, we now have the superior knowledge of computer scientists displacing those pesky lawyers, right? This was the study, right? Because oftentimes, and I have a whole section of a book I've written on automation recently that talks about sort of journalistic biases in presenting these findings. But when they interviewed the lead author in Future Tense, he was extremely humble. He said, I only see this as sort of a stopgap measure to help the court deal with prioritizing which cases it wants to hear uh, because they get flooded with cases. So maybe this would be some small way of dealing with case processing priority, okay? By the way, even there, I have a lot of reservations about it, right? Because one of the funda foundational flaws of such an approach is that whenever you try to apply natural sciences methods to the human world, you know, if you model something in the natural world, it can't change its behavior to react and to outwit you, right? If I model the movement of the moon, the moon can't change how it orbits in order to disprove my theory or to take advantage of my theory. People love doing that, right? <laughs> People do that all the time. And that goes back to, you know, my, my inspiration in all this work that I do is Charles Taylor. And it goes back to Charles Taylor's foundational insights in his responses to a lot of American AI researchers in the 1960s in the explanation of behavior and philosophy of, human, of the human sciences, uh, the both volumes. Um, and so I think that this is one of the, uh, it's, it's really critical for us to know that this effort uh, has to be sort of cabined by, and I think informed by, jurisprudential insights, social scientific insights, and all directed with an aim to augment extant human professionals rather than to replace them.